and that'll be going out live to the world. Amen. mighty name of Jesus and welcome to Cool Church. We're coming to you from 5005 West 34th Street right here in Northwest Houston, Texas. We appreciate you dialing in today and we welcome you. Our family here welcomes you. We're going to give them some love in the spirit. Amen. And uh, thank you so much for dialing in with us. Please start those live watch parties and, you know, like, share and you get your friends involved, and let's get the word out. We're going to bring a good word today to God's people. So uh, we definitely welcome you. Let's stand to our feet, everybody, and um, make our, our, our confession today. Let's do this together. Wave your Bible around. Throw your hand up. You've got the word in your heart somewhere. Amen. Throw your device up, and let's say this together. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. You sound wonderful. You may be seated. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your holy presence in this place. We yield everything to you. Our prayer is corporate, and we all put our faith together to pray this together in one accord. Father, none of us and all of you, we must decrease and you must increase, and we therefore exalt your holy name above everything we do and say and feel and think, and we're careful to give you all the praise and glory for truly it's yours and yours alone. Think through my mind, speak through my mouth, bring forth your word with accuracy, and have your way in this house today. Father, as you would desire, as it would be within your will, draw somebody somewhere into your arms of love today for the very first time. Whether it's through this service or some of the other many, many services that are going on around the world right now, do what you do. Do what you do best, Father God. Draw someone's soul right into your arms of love and bless their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right. So, family of God, uh, the title of this message today is God Feeds the Hungry. Our foundational scripture will be found in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, and we're going to begin with verse 1, okay? So, we'll get into the scripture now. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set... His disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house." Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled." Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so shall be called the least in the kingdom. Amen. The kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of, God, uh, kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled unto thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly while whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Okay? Now, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing and the doing of these verses out of God's holy word today at Cool Church. Okay? All right, so lots and lots of meat there, but you saw where it said in Matthew 5 and 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And what I'd like to encourage you with today is you got yourself up, you got yourself together, you've made the trip, we're in the presence of the Lord in His sanctuary, you're dialing in with social media means wherever you are throughout the world, and that is an indication that you are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Amen? So we thank the Lord for that. Now, there are some show enough trying times that we're living in right now, to say the least. In the thick of a pandemic, an economic, an economic crisis, an absolute uncontrollable political climate, racial divide amongst the unsaved. And I say this because I don't know a single sold out on fire for God believer that would feed into this mess. I'm just going to tell you straight up. I know a lot of people and we have been around some tough times growing up in these, in these streets. Amen. We've had all kinds of trouble in our past. And we've, we've suffered a, a great deal of it in the, in the past life that we've lived. And we are not going back there, no matter what they say on the news. We're just not going back there. We have a rainbow-colored church here. We have people from all kinds of different places in the world, different walks of life, different social economic statuses. We have different histories and family trees. We've crossed every line you can imagine to be in one place at the same time for the same purpose. We don't allow the news media, uh, any type of liberal stuff that's going on to try to deface the, the, the power of this country. We won't feed into it. We're not going to feed into it now. We're not going to feed into it ever. Can I get a witness in the house of God? In the name of Jesus. We are family. Amen. Okay, so um, 
uh, looting and destroying people's businesses and now defacing and tearing down historical statues. I was thinking today as I was driving over, I was thinking, I need to go ahead and see what books are available out there online that, that, that show our monuments and our different historical uh, statutes and everything so that I can get that for my grandchildren and my great-grandbabies. I want to be able to leave them the legacy of what this country was really founded on. Now, was there corruption in the mix? Absolutely beyond the shadow of a doubt from the time that God instituted everything that he instituted. Corruption has been in the world since Genesis. Hello, somebody. It came from the fall of man. Can I get a witness in the house of God? Now, there were many, many things that the people of God suffered. They were his people. They were his chosen people. He could have chose anybody. He chose them. He chose the Hebrews. He brought the truth through them. He brought his bloodline through them. Hello, somebody. They went through all kinds of travesty, all kinds of slavery, all kinds of torment, all kinds of punishment, all kinds of horrendous evil came upon the, the people of the children, uh, the Hebrew children and the people of God. And yet, all of that history is documented in God's own story. It's all here. Nothing has been defaced. Nothing has been t torn down. Could God have put it down? God could have made the, the country of Egypt look like a dent in the earth. He could have made it look worse than the Grand Canyon with one thumbprint. Bam! See ya! But he didn't. He left it there. You can go visit there today and look at the statues of Pharaoh. And you can look at the pyramids and you can get into all that. It's ridiculous what the, the media is trying to do to pit people against each other. And there's no telling how many layers of evil there is, is involved in it all. It's not like one particular party or one particular thing. It's all kinds of evil operating at the same time but we are the children of God and we are hungry and thirsty for truth and we will be filled amen and if judgment starts with us what you think it's going to look like for the rest of them amen come on somebody I mean if you can't run with the footman what you going to do when the horses show up hello come on now in the name of Jesus amen so let's go to John 10.10 10, because all of those things that I mentioned to you, the pandemic, sickness, disease, viruses, plagues, economic crisis, the absolute uncontrollable political climate, the racial divide amongst the unsaved, um, the looting and the destroying, the people's businesses being taken out, the defacing and tearing down of historic, historical statues. I mean, you know that it's not about race when they start uh, defacing Jimi Hendrix's statue in Hollywood. Are you kidding me? Man, there's one thing to tear out Abraham Lincoln. Man, leave Hendrix alone, man. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that in there for a little humor, amen. Come on now. So, so let's go to the Bible and look at John 10.10. 10. Now, I've been talking about this a bit lately, but it, it, it all comes together. So let's look at John 10, uh, 10 from the King James. It says, The thief cometh not. But for to steal and to kill and to destroy, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Okay? So one really good friend of mine, he said these words on social media recently. They close your businesses. They close your church. They close your parks. Hello. They close your beaches. They banned funerals. They banned graduations. They made you wear masks. They banned dads in delivery rooms, uh, but they allow riots, vandalism, arson, looting, and the destruction of the American flag and American history. And we, are, we were all played. Modern psychological warfare is what he deems it is. Modern psychological warfare. Scare people with a virus, place them in quarantine, count the number of the dead every second of every day in every news headline. Close all businesses, 40 million people out of jobs, peak unemployment, remove entertainment, parks, gyms, bars, restaurants, sports, no dating, no touching, mask people, dehumanize them, close temples and churches, create a vacuum, let depression and anxiety and depression set in, then ignite hatred and civil war, civil unrest, empty the prisons because of the virus, and fill the streets with criminals, send, the, uh, send in Antifa, and vandalize property as if they are freedom fighters, undermine the law, loot, attack law, law enforcement, but tell government to order and stand down. 
These constitute death and destruction and thievery. Can I get a witness in the house of the Lord? They constitute death, destruction, and thievery, and they should be lined perfectly up with John 10.10 10 in your Bible. The devil comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But our God came to give us life to the full till it overflows in abundance. Hello, somebody. Welcome to Cool Church. Amen. Welcome, world. We appreciate you dialing in today. All right. Let's look at that, uh, that, that idea now, the, the title of the sermon today. Um, God feeds the hungry, right? So let's, let's look at it like this. God loves the starving, but he feeds the hungry. He loves the starving. He's mindful of their, of their demise. He, his heart is broken over, over their, their not being an intercessor for them. He, he is not a, a man that he should lie. He's not slack concerning his promises like some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering, praying that every soul will come to a place of repentance. Everybody, that's the will of God. That's the heart of God. He wants above everything for you and me to prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. Hello, can I get a witness? Amen. He, he is not driving that hatred. Hate is fake and love is pure. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes on him will not perish but have everlasting life. The suffering of this present time is nothing to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. You and I have a definite need. We have a very definite need to return to our first love, to count the cost, to make sure that we are ready to finish this race. And remember, the race isn't given to the swift nor the strong, but he and she that endureth to the end. May we all receive the end of our faith, even the salvation of our souls. Amen. So now let's look at uh, Amplified Bible, verse Matthew 5, 6, where the word of God is, is, is it's expanded here a bit. It says, blessed and fortunate and happy and spiritually prosperous in that state in which the born-again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that is, uprightness and right standing with God. Uprightness and right standing with God, for they shall be completely satisfied. I want to share with you a text that a friend of mine shared with me this morning. And uh, I can pull it up here pretty quick. So give me just a moment here. And, I, and this is what he sent me. True biblical righteousness is not based on what we do right, but based on what Jesus did for us. We must always remember that God answers our prayers because he is good, not because we are. We can approach him boldly in prayer and expect to hear from him daily. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Getting yourself up on a Sunday morning, getting yourself dressed, whatever you do, coming into the house of the Lord is an indication that you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Righteousness that comes on what Jesus did to make us righteous. And we believe on what he did. Amen? So there's a fault line forming in the very body of Christ, the foundation of the body of Christ. There's a fault line forming. The hotter getting hotter, the colder getting colder. An hour's not an hour anymore. There's a shaking happening, and it's time to stand up and be counted amongst the living. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. We are God's people, and we possess the answer, and the answer is Jesus Christ. Amen? So God hasn't removed the words of slavery from his story concerning the Hebrew children in the Holy Word of God, and we must not remove it from our history. There's no right way to do a wrong thing. I, beyond the shadow of a doubt, 
suffered abuse as a child myself personally in my own family. And that is now a major part of my testimony of how a holy God showed up and showed out and healed me everywhere I hurt. My uh, abuser, I went, uh, he went to heaven with my blessing. I absolutely had no animosity, no pent, it, pent up resentment or anger was left in my spirit because a holy God set me free from the bondages of grief and resentment and bitterness and anger and violence and rage. And I do have a memory of it. I could, I could get into it. I could start telling you detailed accounts of it. You'd be mad. Time I got through explaining to you what happened to me as a child, you'd be fighting mad. Because words are powerful. They carry with them power. So if you spend all of your time meditating on and you get down deep, down deep into the grit of the bad things that happened in your past, you will have more of a struggle and more trouble to break free from it until you admit that, okay, that was then, this is now, I'm going to look up from whence cometh my help. I desire to be healed from the inside out. I choose to take the high road and forgive and release and let go of all of my anger. You see, the Bible says be angry. I, I, like right now, some of the stuff that's going on in the political climate around the world and with people that I know and care about and love, and I hear the things they say on social media. I, I listen to what, you know, I can hear the pain coming through their words. I get that. I understand that. But the Bible says, be angry and don't sin. So it's never going to be right to let your anger go and burn down some Ma and Pa business where that family has, has migrated to America from another part of the world and started a business. And they are bringing a viable, good service to the people in our community and commerce. And now because you're angry, you're going to tear their business up? You're going to deface a statue that has to do with our historical factors because you're mad about something? You need to get a grip. Get over it. Man, I mean to tell you, it's, it's, not, it's not going to be ever right to sin like that. You can't line that up with God's word. Be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Make peace with your past. Amen? You know, I know what I came through. And you know what? The abuse I suffered as a child led me to other things. And I became a drug addict and an alcoholic and a violent criminal as a result of some of the things that I suffered as a child. But I'll tell you what, that didn't stop God from meeting me and greeting me on a concrete floor in a jail cell looking at a life sentence. He still met me right there on that floor, too light to fight, too thin to win. A messed up fool, amen. I'm talking about an aggravated, stupid idiot. Come on, stuck on stupid. Hello, somebody. He still met me right there, and he set me free. And now he surrounded me with some of the most awesomest people with stories that make my story pale in comparison to the things that they went through and suffered. And we're all a big family now. And we've got more family members now around the world than you could possibly imagine because for 20-plus years, my wife and I have been beating the path and plowing the ground, and we have touched tens of thousands of broken people's lives with the message of hope for the hopeless, and that recovery from all forms of sin is possible through a complete surrender to Jesus Christ. If you remove that from my history, I don't know. I, I, think, I think I would just step into boredom right there. I mean, you know, well, what in the world? What am I going to tell them? <laughs> I was just... You know, hunky-dory all my life. Goody two she didn't need God. Amen. Come on, somebody. No, that's not way. That's not way it is for me. My testimony is the reason I can give for the hope that I found in Christ. He met me there. In that pain, in that misery, he walked me through treacherous situations where people were being hurt all around me, and he protected me. I don't even understand it to this day other than my mother's prayers were pretty doggone powerful. Hello, somebody. That woman could move the hands that rule the world with her little faith-filled prayers interceding on behalf of a hard-headed, drug-addicted, crazy man that I was in my past. And now I'm her pastor. What's up with that? Now I take care of her. It's a blessing. It's a, it's a great 
blessing from God to allow me the grace to take care of somebody who walked me through such pain, such stupidity. I mean, anybody would have turned their back on me but her. And, and my dad, he did get, you know, really spent with it. But the truth is, is that he still loved me. He still wanted me to get it. He just was done trying to fund the, the process. Does that make any sense? He just got tired of trying to, trying to fit the bill. So he said, you know what? Um, me and mom, we're going to stay over here. You're going over there with the Lord. You get your healing and holler back. Amen. <laughs> and I did. And he, well, everything was fine. As soon as I got healed, oh, he, he, I had keys to his house when he died. And, and that was a miracle, let me tell you. Because I used to drive in the driveway, and he would tell my mom, he would say, hide your purse, honey. The thief just drove up. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Let's look at John 10.10 10, amplified style. The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Overflowing, abundant, Zoe kind of life, the God kind of life is yours and mine by the grace of God through the Holy Word in spite of everything the devil did to set up us for failure. Amen. But God, the God of all comfort, he comforts you and he comforts me in this time of need. We're going to have to really get stronger. We're going to have to really, really draw closer together. We're going to have to keep on keeping on. We can't quit. It's not over. It ain't over yet. We're still alive. We're still kicking. My dad used to say, still kicking, boy, just not quite as high. Amen. I can feel the pain of that. I'm telling you, it creeps up on you. But God is good. Come on, somebody. We're still in it to win it. And we can do better and we should do better. We should want to do better. Not, not give in, you know. I'm, I'm all good with, you know, the, uh, the social distancing. And, man, I mean to tell you, I'm, I'm good to put my mask on. I'm, I'm with you. And I, I'll, I'll bump you and elbow you. and I'll, It's all good. But I'm not going to just lay down and die. I'm going to get up in the morning and get with the program. I'm going to shake off the heaviness and, and get, get into the presence of God. Seek him first. Seek him early. <laughs> Amen? <clears throat> All right. Now, there is some scripture here about Jesus feeding the multitude. Remember the theme today. God feeds the hungry. He loves the starving, but he feeds the hungry. So listen to some of these accounts here in the Gospels. First of all, feeding the multitude is a term used to refer to two separate miracles of Jesus reported in the gospel. Um, the first miracle, the feeding of 5,000, is reported by all four gospels. So let's look at that one. Matthew 14, 13 through 21. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them and healed, he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, there is a desert place and the time is now past. This is a desert place. The time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give you them to eat. And they said unto him, They say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes. And then looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and, and the disciples to the multitude, and they did all eat and were filled. They took up the fragments that remained, twelve baskets full, and they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. So more than 5,000, 5,000 men plus women and children. He fed them all with five barley loaves and two fishes. 
Because when you break bread with God, he multiplies. He satisfies. He brings contentment. And he doesn't waste the leftovers. He had 12 disciples. I've, I've heard it taught. He had 12 disciples. He probably gave each one of them a basket to take home to the crib. What's up? <laughs> Just like Jesus, right? Just like Jesus. Come on, somebody. Now, if we look at this account from the book of Mark, chapter 6, let's go at it again here, starting in verse 31. And he said unto them, Come you yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot there thither out of all cities and outwent them and came together unto him and Jesus when he came out saw much people and was moved with compassion towards them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd and he began to teach them many things and when the day was now far spent his disciples came unto him and said this is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give you, to eat, give you them to eat. And they said unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. And when they knew, they, they say, Five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit by companies upon the grass. Now this is, uh, this is the power of the wisdom of God. Check this out. And, um, and, and they sat down in ranks by hundreds and fifties. I've always marveled sometimes when, uh, you know, good, good-hearted, fun-loving, spirit-filled, blood-bought, bad-to-the-bone people of God can get right on your noggin about counting people. There is an account where one of the people of God got in trouble counting some souls and stuff. But um, in the book of Acts, they, they, 3,000 people came to Jesus the day Peter stood up and, and preached. Now, this was quite a sermon, too, when Peter stood up and preached. Because you remember, he had just got out of jail for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. <laughs> so he was an ex-offender coming back into society. Come on, a free man. Got his act cleaned up with the Lord through repentance. Everybody say, through repentance. It still exists today, by the way. Through repentance, he got his act cleaned up. And then he stood up and preached a word that was so powerful, 3,000 people, the Bible says, everybody say the Bible says, came to the Lord that day and got saved. Wow. Somebody was counting. Here, Jesus is counting. He says, sit them down in hundreds and fifties upon the grass. And uh, when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and he blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples and set uh, before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they all did eat and were filled. They did all eat and were filled. See, God loves the starving, but he feeds the hungry. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Isn't that good? And they all did eat and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and, uh, and of the fishes, and, they, and they, did, they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. Okay? So, I mean, we can surely uh, see that there is the same account is happening in all of the the disciples there, the, the four, the four uh, Gospels have an account of it. Let's look at Luke chapter 9 and pick up a few verses here that, that describe the same thing. And when the day began to wear away, they, then came the twelve and said unto him, Send the multitude away, that they may go into the towns and country round about and lodge and get victuals. For um, we are here in a desert place. And he said unto them, Give you them to eat. And they said, well, we have no more but five loaves and two fishes, except we should go and buy meat for all this people. And they were about 5,000 men. And he said unto his disciples, uh, make them sit down by fifties in a company. And they did so and made them all sit down. And then uh, he took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and break and gave to the disciples to set before the multitude, and they did, 
eat and were all filled and there was taken up of fragments that remained to them 12 baskets. Now, <clears throat> I saw this work firsthand in a prison setting. I was uh, locked up in a place in Navasota, Texas called Pack Unit. And it was a bunch of old folks there, really, you know, a bunch of old folks there. So it was really quite an experience for me because I'd come from a maximum security prison to this prison, and it was pretty chill and laid back, amen. And I happened to be at the trustee camp, and we had a great team of men and, uh, there, uh, men, you know, coming strong in the Lord and fellowship and, and everything. And so we had, um, you know, kind of got some favor with the kitchen staff and there were some kitchen workers involved and we decided we were going to throw in, you know, everybody throw in some, some pieces to it and then we were going to have a, a big spread and do it in the kitchen for the body of Christ that was gathered at that camp. Well, when we got all the soups and the, and the sneak, uh, cheese and the snack crackers and the, uh, you know, all the Fritos and the jalapenos and the roast beef and the chili and the spam and whatever else we had, we, everybody threw in a little something. We got it all together. We looked at it. We looked at the people that were in the, in, in, out there in the kitchen area sitting at the tables and we said, mm-mm, this ain't looking good. I don't think we got enough. You know, a couple of us was having some really serious doubts, like, I don't know if we're going to make it. And then the main guy, this guy, he's in heaven now. His name was uh, Mac, L.C. McClellan, and he was a spirit-filled fella. And he stepped in there, and he said, step aside, boys. And he said, let's pray over this together. So we went, he laid hands on that, got us all to lay hands on the, all the goods, all the commissary there. We prayed and asked God to bless and multiply, and I kid you not, we had enough to feed everybody, and there was some left over. I saw this principle work in a prison setting with a bunch of Christians. Amen? So the last account that we're going to look at is John chapter 6. And also another thing, you notice how Luke's account was shorter and to the point. See, the more educated a person is, it seems they use fewer words. <laughs> you, know, you notice that? Okay, so he was the doctor in the group, amen? So now let's look at John's account. He's the one that Jesus loved best, right? Um, in chapter 6, verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which has uh, five barley loaves and uh, two small fishes. But what are they among so many? And Jesus said, make the, make the men sit down. Uh, now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fish, to the fishes as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said unto the, his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, <laughs> and which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Isn't that fabulous? God feeds the hungry. Amen? He feeds the hungry. And then those men, in verse 14, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth that, that prophet uh, that should come into the world. So God feeds the hungry. Now, uh, are you hungry and thirsty for righteousness this morning? Are you hungry and thirsty for righteousness that are dialing in on the social media network there? If so, God says, you shall be filled. You shall be filled. Seek first his kingdom and all of his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Look at verse 24. No man can serve two masters. 
For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. A lot of times preachers like myself have been known to, you know, really hit mammon hard as that it is money. But it is a lot worse than just money. But remember, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money itself answers all things. It says so in the Bible. So money can be a wonderful slave, but it's an absolute horrible master. Come on, somebody. So you apparently don't have to have money to love it. Hello. I know I threw a considerable amount of my life away for peanuts in the grand scheme of things. I thought I, last time I went to prison, I spent five years and three months for shoplifting a $30 cordless drill. That's a pretty hefty price to pay for a $30 cordless drill. Can I get a witness in the house of the Lord? Come on, don't hate now. Celebrate. See, I'm not, I've been telling you for, for weeks here, put the hater rage jug down and get off the gas, switch the lane, er, er, do a U-turn, put some new lean in that cup and get on down Straight Street, take a ride on Restoration Boulevard. You'll be a whole person. Amen? Amen. God is good. He's faithful. Now, sometimes you got to go left to get right, but if you don't get right, you will get left. Amen? <laughs> so praise the Lord. Now, so you cannot serve God and mammon, not just reducing it down to money. It's the devil himself. It's the devil himself. Amen. And therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat in the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He feeds the hungry, see? Or, or, or are you not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubic unto his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Now remember, remember this. We tend to serve our thoughts. And I think you can really see that that's being highlighted here. That's what we tend to do. That's why you have to be careful what you give your attention to. Because whatever you give your attention to, your desire will follow. So whatever you keep hearing, you'll eventually believe. So if you listen to nothing but the news, the news, the news, the news, then you're going to get that stuff inside your spirit, and it's going to taint you. It's going to affect you negatively. You cannot just listen to that all the time. Matter of fact, it's gotten so bad that you can't hardly believe anything they say. The way you know they're lying is their lips are moving. I used to tell my daughter that about boys. Amen. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> all right. So, so wherewithal shall we be clothed? So for after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But here it is, family. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. we got enough to contend with right here and right now. So, now, I think that God has allowed, uh, in the spirit of his grace... A pretty good picture to be drawn here in today's service. I think that our sermon today, given from God by the Holy Spirit, and I just received it, and, and I believe it was an on-time, I believe it is an on-time word for an on-time church. I think that it's included the real stuff that we're really walking through right now as a people. And, uh, and I do believe that our hope is in Christ. And I do believe that the enemy is trying to break down the constitution of our belief system. And I think that it's very evident that the people that are doing this damage in our country, they, they have one thing on their mind, and that's they hate America. 
I don't think it's really, it, it, it's not, it can't be about race if they're going to def, deface the, the, the face of Abraham Lincoln. If they're gonna if they're gonna mess up Jimi Hendrix statue out in front in Hollywood, that, that, that that's not there's nothing but there's no racism in that. That's just hate. That's just hate all along the watchtower. You know what's up, amen. And the wind cries, Mary. You know, come on, <laughs> get a grip. Hello, somebody. So look what God says in Philippians chapter four, verses four through eight from the Amplified Bible. Rejoice in the Lord always, delight, gladden yourselves in him. Again, I say rejoice. Let all men know and perceive and recognize your unselfishness, your considerateness, your forbearing spirit. The Lord is near. He is coming soon. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. Listen to that verse. Listen to that verse. You and I got to admit that this whole thing that's been happening from one instance to the other, and I made mention of them at least twice, if not three times in today's sermon, the pandemic, the, the economic crisis, the, the hatred, the racism, the political climate. Come on, all these things together create a great opportunity for you and I to be filled with anxiety and fear and doubt and unbelief. But somebody say, no, sir, not me. No, sir, not, me. not me. Oh, no. As for me and my house, come on. We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. As for me, say, it, say it with me. Say, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will look up from whence cometh our help. We will live our life without all of the bitterness and the resentment and the anger and the violence and the rage and the destruction. We will stand the test of time. We will continue to look up from whence cometh our help. We will be counted amongst the living. I'm telling you, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to tell you how to vote. All you got to do is read the Bible. All you, and you need, if you can vote, you need to vote. And, and you need to understand that we are under some serious fire here. And I don't have to jump on the bandwagon and start hollering and screaming at you. Let me tell you something, friend. Get yourself a checkup from the neck up. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. We've got a lot on the line here. We are America. And we need to stand for the freedom that so many of our men and women have shed their precious blood to give us the right to have. Come on, somebody. Amen. I don't need your newscast to tell me how to vote. I ain't buying that lie. And I ain't never going to hate my family because they're a different color skin or from a different part of the world. That includes everybody around the world. I love them all in the name of Jesus. When I have a hard time loving somebody because of the way they act, and I do, sometimes I do. Hello, be real, be transparent, tell the truth, shame the devil. Come on, come on. Some people are hard to love. Yes, they are. I've been, I've been one of them. I guarantee you, I've been one of them in my past. My mother kept loving me. I, I love that revelation. Now, see, I've said it so many times, I can quit giving Eddie B. the credit for it because now I can say it like it's mine. I've said it two or three, four times in the last three, four, five weeks, you know? <laughs> but no, he, he said that the Lord told him, just love people in the image that God created them in. The Lord told him, just if you have trouble loving them, just love the image that I created them in, my image. Bam. That's a good word. That's rhema right there. I need that. I can use that in my business. I'm going to put that in my, in my pocket. I ain't going to hock it for nothing. Amen. Love people by the image that God created them in. Just love them. Love them past their faults. I'm not saying uh, cross the lines of your healthy boundaries. Good Lord, child, if you can tolerate it, you can't change it. If a woman can tolerate a man who beats her, do you think he's going to stop? Just read this history. Just put your mind on things. You know, and that, that abuse goes across every line anyway, but I'm just saying, you, 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 if you can tolerate it, you can't change it. Whatever you keep hearing, you'll eventually believe. That's why you and I should be listening to the Word of God being read by our eyes with our voices out loud 
listening with our ear and especially our inner ear the words of God that we read in the Bible and we should be reading it every day out loud. I said we should be reading the holy word of God to ourselves out loud every day. Every day. Read it. Find the promises. Go over the promises of God. Document them. Write them down. Write them on index cards. Put them on sticky notes. Put them on the mirror. Put them in the kitchen on the icebox. Put them by the sink. Put them over there by the toaster. Get them, get, put them on the dash of your car. Put them on your lunch kit. I mean, get the word. Get the word. Get the word. Write the word down. Speak the word. Read the word. Believe the word. Study the word. Whatever you keep hearing, you'll eventually believe. I've told heroin addicts, come on, somebody. Oh, there he goes talking about drugs again. Well, get over it. This is a recovery-oriented, restoration-type ministry. You're going to hear a little something about dope every now and then. Oh, gone it. There's a whole. There's probably people in here right now on dope. What's up? Amen. So it just is what it is. Amen. Come on, shoot. I mean, just deal with it. Amen. Come on. You understand? But I've told heroin addicts that were coming. I mean, they were doing monstrous amounts of heroin, going through some serious pain and agony. They were going to get real, real sick, real sick. I've been there. I know how sick one gets. It hurts. You feel like everything's being wrung out like a wet wash rag at the joints. I mean, everything hurts. It hurts. You want a candy bar or something. Give me some sugar, man. I mean, come help me. Help me. Amen. And so when that person's in that condition, I have told them by the Spirit of God, confess these words over your life and do it over and over and over again. I've told alcoholics this when they were going through DTs and maybe to a point of having seizures. Hello, somebody. Say this to yourself over and over and over again. Pray it unto God. All sin, sickness, and disease is a form of the curse. But I have been redeemed from the curse by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. All forms of sin, sickness, and disease are a form of the curse. But I have been redeemed from the curse by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And it's coming out of Galatians 3.13, but if a person, it doesn't matter if they're a heroin addict, an alcoholic, uh, some other type of drug, PCP, wet, it don't matter what it is, but if a person would speak that over their life, they could, they could have cancer. They could have a, a heart problem. They could have any number of things wrong with them, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whatever they keep hearing, they'll eventually believe. And the power of death and life is in the tongue. So why wouldn't you want to speak the blessing of Abraham over your life? It makes you rich and it adds no sorrow. Why wouldn't you want to just chime in, get on in with the get down? Amen. Come on with it. Amen. Get to the reading and studying and speaking and believing. And whatever you keep hearing, you'll eventually believe. And, and your belief is the most powerful thing you have go going for you. Because all things are possible to those who believe which I believe is an indication all things are not possible to those who doubt. I think that's what that might mean. Do you, do you agree? Does it kind of make sense? If, if all things are possible to those who believe, then perhaps all things are not possible to those who doubt. I think I'll just, I'll choose belief. I choose belief. I believe, Lord. I believe your word is sacred and holy and true. I believe that you hold your word above your name, and your word is forever settled in the heavens and upon the earth. And I believe that. So Philippians 4, 4 through 8 says again, Rejoice in the Lord always. Delight, gladden yourselves in him. Again I say, rejoice. Let all men know and perceive and recognize your unselfishness, your considerateness, your forbearing spirit. The Lord is near. He's coming soon. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. But in every circumstance and in everything, notice not for everything, but in everything, in spite of everything. Can you just say in spite of everything? Spite. By prayer and petition, that is definite request, definite request. Get real graphic with it, real detailed with your request. With thanksgiving, be thankful. Continue to make your wants known to God. It's okay. He, he, he's okay. But you'll find yourself, as you press into this, you'll start leaving the grocery list out of the prayer pretty doggone soon, and you'll just enjoy being in his presence. 
It's okay. Bring your grocery list. It's okay. He's, 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 he's God. He can handle here in your grocery list. But at some point, you're probably going to put the grocery list down and just say, you know what, Daddy? I just want to be with you. I just want to seek your face. Put you first. I want to spend time with you. You know, no matter how good or bad an earthly father is, God is a father to the fatherless. You know, my dad was a really, really good man, a hard-working man. There's people in the room that knew him, that actually knew him when he was alive several years ago. He was a really, really hard-working, decent man. But he didn't know about God. He didn't know about God like you know about God. He didn't know about God like I know about God. So he couldn't give me, his son, what he didn't have. Now, did that cost me some grief? It sure did. It sure did. Now, I don't blame my dad for my, for my shenanigans. My shenanigans was my own choice. A great, a great man of God who's now, now in heaven, a, a pastor named Jim Scalise, once said in a jail, and I was in the room as an inmate, he said, how many of you in here think God puts you in this place? Man, hands were going up all over the place. I even raised my hand. I figured, well, God did it. You know, God did it. He said, no, no, no. God didn't put you in here. It was your crime that put you in here. It was your choice to use and abuse and put your hands on other people's property and do all the damage and the evil and the sin you did. That was on you. And it made so much sense. I mean, I just kind of brought my hand down. I thought I might want to rethink that one. You know, I'm convinced if you give it a second thought, you can be the smartest one in your family. <laughs> just, just two thoughts, amen. <laughs> just give it a second thought, amen. So I did, and I think that's true. And so verse 7 says, And God's peace shall be yours, that tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ, and so fearing nothing from God, and being content with its earthly lot of whatever sort that is, that peace which transcends all understanding, it goes past what you can know or, or comprehend. It passes knowledge. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that cool? It passes knowledge. Garrison and mount guard over your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You can have peace both in your heart and in your mind through Christ Jesus at the same time, simultaneously. In an age where people have a certain peace and confidence in their heart, but because they keep listening to the wrong things, <clears throat> they're getting very anxious and very uncertain about stuff that's going on, and it's really, really causing some havoc in their mindsets. Worry, fear, doubt, unbelief. That's what the enemy's after. He wants to get you all jacked up like that. Because if he can get you like that, you ain't going to have no joy. There's a joy in believing. Re believe that. There's a joy in believing. There's a joy in being able to say, I believe that if God be for me, who dare be against me, for greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And if they annihilate my life, if they make me a wax spot on the ground right now with a, an explosive device, I will be in the presence of my Father instantaneously in the name of Jesus. There's a hope in that. It's the blessed hope. It's where Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he rose up victorious on the third day. Now that's the kind of Sunday service I can wrap my faith around. I need Jesus. How about you? I need to seek him first, his kingdom, all of his righteousness, and everything else will be added, right? The suffering of this present time is nothing to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Will we suffer? Well, Jesus said we would. He said you will suffer persecution if you'll be a born-again believer. He said they'll count it like it's joy, like they're doing God a favor to take us out. He said, blessed are you when men revile you and speak all manner of evil about you falsely for his name's sake. <laughs> for you shall be blessed. Amen? Amen? So then we get to verse 8. For the rest, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of reverence, and is honorable and seemly, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and lovable, Whatever is kind and winsome and gracious, 
if there is any virtue and excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on and weigh and take account of these things. In other words, fix your mind on them. Fix your minds on them. You need to set your mind. That was Wednesday night service there. Set, you, you can go back and get that on YouTube. Amen. Set your mind affectionately on things that are above, not on the things of this earth. Listen, they can say anything they want to say. And I'm, and I'm, I'm listening to portions of it because I want to I be aware. You know, I mean, it's the knowledge of good and evil, right? And I hear all kinds of stuff, and I know it's real complex, and it's very layered, and it's very difficult for just the average lay person to put their mind on all of it and have it all figured out. I'm very, very concerned about the one or the ones who think they've got it all figured out because it seems to me that there's a whole lot going on that you might not really know what's going on. <laughs> you know, I like to say it like this. I only know what I know, and I do not know what I don't know. It's pretty simple, but it's true. Do you know what you don't know? <laughs> I don't. Amen. But what I do know about God has changed my life, and it's given me joy every day. In spite of a whole lot of trouble around me, I'm able to get up, get myself together, and get with the program and see if I can't find somebody to help. Amen. And you know what? Every day I find numerous people to help. Oh, my gosh, they seem to be all around me. Somebody somewhere needs a word, you know. Hallelujah. So somebody needs the word you got. And you know how you'll get it better? When you give it away. The more you give it, the more accountable you'll hold yourself to the truth you love. For anybody in recovery... That is a principle of recovery that works as well as anything I've ever seen. In order to keep it, you got to give it away. What was that, the red hot chili peppers? Give it away, give it away, give it away. Yeah, something like that, right? Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yes, we just got to do something, man. You know what I mean? Just get out there and give somebody a reason for the hope you found in Christ. Tell them there's hope for you. Sometimes the, 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 the level of pain that I hear in others' lives when they begin to really graphically tell me about the breakdowns of this and that in their life and their family, it's so hard that I find myself completely helpless. I, wonder, I mean, I even ask myself while I'm listening, I, I, what am I going to tell them? What, what can I say? I know pain. Everybody knows pain, right? Don't we all have pain? I have pain. Do you have pain? But sometimes the pain I hear in other people's lives makes my pain pale in comparison. And then I wonder, well, what in the world would you say about that? And the Lord will nudge me. And I know you've heard me say it before. Those of you faithful people are cool. But it's true. I always get the nudge. And the nudge is, give them my word. Give them my word. Tell them my word. And when I obey God and give them his word, I don't know what happens after, way after, but his word works while I'm giving it because you can feel it in the atmosphere. The word of God will wash over them, and, and you can almost hear the sigh of relief in their soul. It's like, oh, I feel better now. Oh, thank you for encouraging me with the word. Now, it, 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 didn't, it, didn't, you know, it didn't take care of the horrendous financial thing that they needed. It, that was bigger than I could have touched. Hello. It's bigger than you could have touched, I think. But I gave them the word, and the word was sufficient to bring a certain amount of peace to their soul. So it's not the least you can do is pray with somebody. It's the most powerful weapon you've got. So pray. Pray with others. Don't let them leave your presence without a quick prayer. You don't have to go pray every elegant word you ever heard. You don't have to do it all sacrilegious and plastic and, you know, whatever. You know, just be genuine, be pure, be real, but pray with them. Say, Father God, I ask you to touch my brother, touch my sister with the power of your grace, your mercy, and your love. Heal them everywhere they hurt. 
touch the depth of their soul with the power of your grace. Draw them into your arms of love. They can't come if you don't draw them. They can't say Jesus is Lord without you. You're involved in every salvation. Help somebody today, my Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And be glad for what you have accomplished. You know, the deck is stacked pretty bad against us all, I guess you'd say, wouldn't you say? We don't even know what, what all's coming up ahead, do we? Have a, we don't have, I mean, you can read the Bible and get a pretty full meal deal of what's coming, but, but if, you, if you don't know, you do know down deep inside that it's getting worse. Amen? The stage is being set for his return. He's coming back. Oh, he's coming back. Imagine the stories they'll tell on fake news when that, when that happens. Oh, wee, boy, they're going to have some stories. Then. Aliens have invaded Earth. Oh, my God. <laughs> Amen. I got a message the other day on social media. Atheist against Christian ads. And they told me that what I do is not cool. So one of my people fired off a message to him and said, we're praying for you. Amen. We're praying for you. You know, that could be any one of us feeling that way. People are hopeless. But we have the truth. And people need to know what we know. And now, it looks like they're going to need to know a lot more of what we know. Some of us are, are probably scratching our head, what do I know, you know, about the, the stuff that's being, ha that's being tore up and destroyed around us, you know? You, you feel me? <clears throat> In the cool signature statement around here, which we read, you know, weekly, multiple times, and we now are doing it on social media, uh, our signature statement says, at cool, Christ over our life, we accept the Word of God as absolute truth. The Word of God is infallible, inerrant, irrefutable, undeniable, inexhaustible, God-inspired, and God-breathed. We also say that it's, it's all-sufficient. No matter what any or all of us does, says, feels, or thinks, if it does not line up with God's Word, we are wrong and God is right. Based upon the premise of God's Word in Proverbs 23, 7, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, which sounds so genderized, my spiritual father, Dr. Paul Carlin, said it like this, People, all people, men, women, and children, people do what they do, because they believe what they believe. And if people believe lies, it produces problems in their thinking, which produces darkened emotions, which produces godless behavior. The world always treats a person the way they think, feel, or act. And God always starts with the way a person believes in their heart. Amen? So all things are possible to those who believe. Do you believe? Is there any believers in here today? Do you believe it's possible that somebody could either be in this room or dialing in on social media that has not crossed that line of faith at this point in their life? Now, <clears throat> just slicing and dicing and being real, it is possible that somebody is watching us on the Internet right now that knows more about God than you and I could even shake a stick at. They may have more knowledge about the history of the times of biblical life and the development of all of the people groups and the regions of the world and the geography and all the... I just may have oodles of knowledge and have never received Christ into their heart. Amen? And it would be a travesty to us here at Cool if you missed the opportunity to open your spirit and receive Jesus, the mighty Christ, to be your personal Lord and Savior. That's what we want for you more than anything else in the world. There's no greater miracle than a man, a woman, or a child to open their heart to God and truly receive Jesus for themselves personally, not riding on my mom's faith or my dad's faith or my grandma or my grandpa or even my brother or my sister or my wife or whoever, but personal development of belief that opens my spirit to God and says, Jesus, take the wheel. Amen? Amen? So wherever you are in the whole wide world, either here or out there, if you've never made peace with God and you want to do so for the first time today, 
I want to give you that opportunity in just a moment. Now, what I would ask you to do is let me know if, if it worked like that for you. It would be important to me, personally, it would be important to me to have you make a comment, I got saved today in the name of Jesus. If you are here or out there and you've backslidden and you're, you're not right with God and things are going on in your world and you've been stressed and filled with anxiety and fear and doubt and unbelief and all kinds of things are going wrong in your life and you're just going through so much pain and hurt and, and relationships broken and destroyed and loss of things that were valuable to you and you find yourself in a need to return to your first love. I want to give you that opportunity today. But there are many here and there are many out there that you, you're, you're, you're in neither one of those categories. You, you're, you're pressing in. You're doing good. You love God. You are spirit-filled. You are blood-bought. You're redeemed. You're pressing into your new life with Christ. We thank God for you, all of you, all of you. We ask you to just pray with fervor and strength and courage and boldness. Pray out loud with your own voices on either side of that equation, whether you're coming to Christ for the first time or you're rededicating your life to him or you're just strong in the Lord and you're just agreeing with the faith that's being extended out to heaven. Let's pray together right now out of a heart that believes. Say, Lord, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, I repent of my sin. I denounce Satan. I rebuke the devil. And I ask you, Lord, come into my life in a deeper, more meaningful way. Take back all the ground, Lord, that I've given to the devil on every level. I crown you the Lord of all. And in the name of Jesus, I serve notice on the devil now. Devil and demon forces, get out of my life. I'll not serve you anymore. Jesus is my Lord, and I'm going to serve him with my whole heart, now and forevermore. And now, God, you're more than my God. You're my heavenly Father, and I worship you in spirit and in truth all the days of my life. Fill me full of the Holy Spirit. Give me the power to keep your word. I commit to you. I will read, study, and obey everything you say each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Family of God, this is my part. It's the priestly blessing. Please keep your spirits open big and receive the priestly blessing now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his love and power and healing and restoration and deliverance and bless the work of your hands and give you favor, favor, favor everywhere you go. May God go right before you, open up all the right doors, close the wrong doors, keep the right ones open and the wrong ones closed so that you and I can enter into the deeper flow of his love and provision for ourselves and our families while he prevents us from making any further mistakes, no more error, but you and I together as his children receive the end of our faith, even the salvation of our souls in Jesus' name. I'm Pastor Boyd Harrell signing off for today. Please stay tuned, like, share, and subscribe. And thank you for your support and your prayers. We want to hear your praise reports and your prayer requests. And we give God the praise and glory for you. Thank you for dialing in today. Peace. We're out.